Good day, my friends. It is a joy to see and share space with you again. It has been some time since I have made myself available to come and speak to you in this type of forum. And indeed, it has been some time since I have even been back in Virginia. And while I know that at this time of year, many of my friends and family are beginning to bemoan the heat that they know is soon to come in a Virginia summer, I must tell you candidly that I am enjoying every ounce of the sun that I can. I have recently returned from spending yet another winter with my husband at the latest encampment of Valley Forge, so much so that the general and I have uh, begun to jest that my new name should be the Great Perambulator for how often I have gone to visit him now. Admittedly, it were never um, part of a conversation that we had when he was appointed to be commander-in-chief of these continental forces, but I find that I am most useful to him by traveling to these encampments. And I will say that the last encampment, I felt my use immensely, for it was a very harsh winter at Valley Forge where I just spent the last several months. But I was able to stay long enough to have a grand celebration at the announcement of the French Alliance. And friends, you would have been proud of the celebrations that were put on in the camp. Everyone was assembled and the declaration was read and then there was cannons firing and musketry and answering. Well, you would have almost thought that that joy had eased the cold winter that those soldiers had just experienced. But I am now finding myself back in Virginia, and admittedly, friends, in the sanctity and privacy of this conversation, Virginia has been where my heart and my head has been the entire time that I've been away, and in particular with one person, my niece, Fanny Bassett. Fanny is, well, I guess she is 11 years old now, and late last fall, Fanny, Fanny lost her mother, my sister, Anna Maria Dandridge Bassett. And you must understand, my friends, Anna Maria and I, we, we were the closest of friends. Born uh, with three brothers in between us, but there was a bond betwixt us that I think only sisters can truly understand. I, being the eldest of all of the Dandridge children, I was followed in succession by three brothers, John, William, and Bartholomew. And finally, when I was seven or eight years old, my dearest sister arrived, and I recall on the very day of her birth, I proclaimed to my parents, she is mine. <laughs> and I treated her as thus from the moment she arrived. Oh, as children, she was my constant playmate. And as we grew, well, we shared in the joys that those next great life passages would bring to both of us. She stood by my side at my marriage to my first husband, Mr. Custis, celebrated in the miraculous birth of all of my children. And I, of course, was by her side as she married her beloved Burl Bassett. But of course, with all the great joys that those life passages give you. Sorrow must come with it. And we held each other's hands as we both experienced loss, and we both grew from it. Of course, when I married, well, the colonel as he was then, it took me five days' ride away from my dear sister, who kept her estate along the banks of the Pamunkey. But that did not stop the companionship and friendship that we had enjoyed for so long. It merely replaced itself with letters, and we would write to one another with such intimacy that, well, I think sometimes even our husbands felt as though we had some sort of secret language that only we could cipher. And it was in one of those letters several years ago that I began to understand that Anna Maria was not herself. Oh, she would never, she would never admit it to me, but I could tell. And the last time I saw my dear sister was last fall, I came down to Williamsburg to collect my nephews to receive their smallpox inoculation. I myself already receiving it back in the summer of 76 in Philadelphia. Anna Maria, although hesitant about having her children inoculated, we agreed that if I were to take them, that she would have comfort in knowing that they would be administered by their dear aunt. And of course the boys came through it miraculously well. 
and I sent them back home with a letter to my sister. Had I known that that would be the last time that I would ever write, my dear sister, perhaps I would have said so much more. But only the divine providence knows of these things. For not two weeks after that, her husband wrote to me saying that our dear friend had had a sweet release. And I wrote to Burl that perhaps we were only a short time behind her. In that same letter, though, I recounted a promise that I had made to my sister. For you see, many years ago, we had promised each other that should one or the other of us pass away, and should we have the blessing of having daughters, that the surviving sister would raise the daughter of the one left behind. And I remember she reminded me of this pledge when my own daughter died several years ago. And at the time, of course, I thought perhaps she was just a sister trying to ease a grieving heart. But now I wonder if she saw more in that. And I have told Burl that I should like to make good on that promise and that if he would allow Fanny to come and live with me that I will act as a parent and a mother to her for the rest of my days. For Fanny, she is without a mother now. And as you are all well acquainted, my friends, a female education, it is imperative to be passed down within the female side of the family. For, of course, her father would give her a very fine education. But there is something very special that only another woman can give. And so it is my hope to honor my sister, and perhaps even in a way to honor my own dear daughter that passed away too young, in having the privilege of raising my niece, Fanny. I have not been able to see her as my duty to my husband and my duty to the country called me to Valley Forge, but now I am home. No longer Lady Washington for a time, but just Mrs. Washington, and more importantly, an aunt, eager to see and ease the broken heart of a dear niece. So you will have to forgive me, my friends, if I am a bit melancholy at the beginning of our conversation, but I think perhaps you might understand a bit more why now. But let us shake off this melancholy. I came with the hope and expectation that we might have pleasant conversation, and it is my hope that pleasant conversation we shall have. I am joined by my man, Mr. Smith, whom I am sure is more than eager to... Um, field questions, should you have them to me, about anything that I might have spoken of or any questions that you might have. I do have the honor of telling you that when last I saw His Excellency General Washington, he was in perfect health and, in fact, perfect felicity for the first time in several years, I should say. But um, I shall turn the conversation to Mr. Smith now to see where it might take us next. Mr. Uh, Smith. I, I thank you, Mrs. Washington. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, speaking candidly and open about uh, your life, your past uh, several years, uh, included of which is uh, uh, some trauma. Um, sorry to hear that, but, um, but there's perhaps some universal um, strain of being human, and I'm sure that our guests will uh, uh, find uh, some hearkening to you. Uh, our question that I want to begin with is, um, about child rearing, um, you mentioned that there are only some things that uh, uh, should be passed or that the uh, female might be able to better pass uh, education along to a, a, someone of the same sex. Are there different expectations for educating a boy versus a girl? And if so, what does that look like? Oh, indeed, Mr. Smith. Uh, you yourself, I'm sure, received a very fine college education in Latin, in Greek, in the great philosophes of old, in military history, for that is imperative for young gentlemen to have. Um, my friends, my education was at the hand of my mother, just as all of my sisters have been. And it is very important for us to learn how to manage a household. And not to be too jovial about it, Mr. Smith, but I have yet to read a housewifery book written in Latin or Greek. It is just not important for us to have that level of education, but how to manage a household is its own art and mystery indeed. 
My mother educated myself and my sisters to be Roman matrons over our own household. Indeed, there is nothing that happens under my roof that I am not aware of, capable of doing, or more than capable of instructing one of my people to do. And it is that skill set that I intend to pass down to my own niece. And again, as I said, Mr. Bassett, I'm sure, would find a way to give Fanny a wonderful education. And indeed, my own daughter benefited from the arts of a tutor when they were very young. She shared one with her own brother. But at a certain point, a woman's place is to manage a household. And there is great pride and dignity in the ability that a woman has in managing her house. So it is those skills and that mystery that I am very keen to pass to that next generation of being my niece. Um, I do hope that that answers your question a bit further. It does. Uh, it does indeed. Um, I, I have no doubt that you'll, you'll have a, a great amount of joy in, in this education. Um, I'm wondering, how often will Fanny be able to visit her family? Oh, my heavens, uh, a very fine question to wonder. Fanny, should she have the ability to come and live with me, uh, understanding that, unfortunately, as of right now, it is impossible, what with my duty to my husband, if we are to continue in this conflict, I have every expectation that wherever the general finds himself in the winter, I will be by his side. And I should not like to bring Fanny all the way up, five days' ride away from everything that she holds dear, only to leave her by herself once again. So while this conflict is continuing, she will stay in New Kent with her father and her brothers, of course. But should she have the ability to come and live with me, I should make it very clear to Fanny that she may visit her father, her brothers, whenever the wind and whenever the whim might hit her. Um, it is in no way that I wish to deprive her of her natural family, for I suppose that I am her natural family as well, but there is a special relationship betwixt a daughter and a father that I do not think uh, distance can harm, but of course we should wish Fanny to have that relationship as frequently as she wishes. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Washington. We have a, a question from Susie, uh, and Susie's wondering, um, what are your concerns about uh, this inoculation, this vaccine? Were you concerned? And also, what was the, can you talk about the process? Of the smallpox inoculation? Yes. Oh, well, Susie, you, you know, you voice the concern of many Americans for this inoculation is something that, while it has been wildly popular in Europe and quite fashionable for some time, it has struggled to take a foothold here in the Americas. Um, you know, the smallpox inoculation is something that came over, I believe it were um, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, in fact, who her husband was the ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, that is correct, and she observed in that space how those natives were inoculating their children from this disease. And she brought this idea all the way back to England. And in fact, she was able to convince the queen herself to undergo, um, I believe it was called the Royal Experiment, where they took near on 12 convicted felons and they told them, you may either be sentenced to death or you may receive this inoculation. And can you imagine, Susie, that every single one of them opted for the inoculation? Now, they were inoculated uh, under the care and guidance of a great number of um, physicians and apothecaries and, of course, newspapermen, and all 12 of them survived. Now, it has uh, come to some fashion here in America and I will be honest, I myself did not trust it, but my son, John, received his inoculation on the hopes of attending a grand tour of Europe. Now, I will say the general was very ill towards me about that because he and my son contrived to take the inoculation without telling me, and they were only going to tell me if he survived it, if, mind you, he survived it. But regardless, my son did survive it and came through it exceedingly fine. But I'll tell you, Susie, my entire outlook was changed on inoculation when I saw the suffering of the poor citizens of Boston after the liberation of Boston in March of 76. I was there and I saw the thousands of citizens affected by that disease. In fact, my own husband did not even allow me to go into the city proper until it had been appropriately cleaned for fear of my catching it. And I recognized at that time that if I truly were to be able to be helpful to my husband, 
that it would be the best benefit to take every precaution that I possibly could against this disease, since there is an availability to protect yourself from it. Now, mind you, the inoculation process itself is not for the faint of heart, of course. But I do not wish for you to think that you lay on a table and they gouge your arm open and anything of that sort. No, it is a mild procedure wherein they cut the scarf of your skin, perhaps on your arm, perhaps on your leg, no thicker than the depth of a piece of paper. And upon that lancet, you might have some of the matter, if you will, from a pustule. And the notion is that by drawing the blood, that that matter will get into your system and it will give you a mild form of the disease itself. I was fortunate enough to take it the very first time it was offered to me. It was the summer of 76 in Philadelphia, which I suppose there was something else important going on in that summer as well. But I was under quarantine. And thankfully, I, in the process of undergoing it, received no pustules on my face. But at the conclusion of it, I found that I was protected in a different sense. And I had a different type of peace about me, not only in knowing that I had done everything in my power to protect myself, but also that I had been a representation of my family. For at that time, the general was very aware of the need of inoculations for the soldiery as well. I hope that this perhaps has put some of your fears aside. Um, as far as the inoculation process. Mr. Smith. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you. You spoke, Mrs. Washington, about uh, suffering and care for uh, those around you uh, in, when, when concerning the uh, smallpox inoculation. We have three questions uh, about care that might have been given perhaps most recently in this past winter at uh, Valley Forge. They are from Beverly, Mike, and Anita, and I think all of them are, are fantastic questions, but I want to start with Beverly's. Beverly's asking, uh, what do you feel might have been uh, your greatest contribution uh, at this most recent winter uh, camp? Oh, Beverly. Um, well, I'm not one to speak of my own um, praise, um, for I do not believe that I am anything extraordinary. Um, but I will be perfectly frank with you, Beverly. I know my duty during these encampments. And it is not to pick up a musket with bayonet and fight alongside the soldiery. Because you must understand, Beverly, that during the encampments, the fighting has died, but the politicking has begun. And my duty during this time is to bring ease and comfort to my husband. For if the general is at his ease and comfort, then we find that the rest of the camp is able to be at their ease and comfort. Um, my duty is to manage his household. Again, something that every woman is educated to do. My duty is to entertain, to host meals and dinners. For at the encampments, of course, dignitaries, uh, both foreign and local, congressmen, their wives, other officers, are all coming to share time and space with His Excellency. And it is imperative for the health and continuance of the army and this cause that the army be displayed to its fullest intent. For I do not know of any foreign power who might be able to give us aid that wish to invest themselves in an army that looks as though they might lose. And so thus while, and I do not think that my husband would mind me saying this, while my husband may be the general of the battlefield, I am the general of the dinner table. And that is where I find myself most useful, is managing that household, and in particular, his dinner table. Thank you. This is uh, perhaps a, a beautiful segue into Mike's question, and that is about uh, uh, your husband's morale, and if you could give to us, uh, if you feel comfortable, some uh, instance or moment when you were specifically concerned with your husband's morale and how you might have aided him? You know, Mike, that is an excellent question. It is indeed a bit personal, but uh, being old friends, as I'm sure we are, I'm sure His Excellency will not mind sharing with you. I have never seen the general so stressed or anxious as I saw him at the start of this winter season. Um, the weight of this grand experiment is on his very broad and capable but human shoulders. 
you know, Mike, my husband has fought in one war before, in the war against the French and the Indian. He has sent men to their death, and he understands the weight and gravity and responsibility that that has on a man's soul. And in fact, it is why he was hesitant to even accept the command offered to him this time. And he feels that weight of responsibility keenly, for he feels the great weight of responsibility for every soul under his command, be they a fellow officer or a common foot soldier. So I cannot say that his morale has been very high as of late. Betwixt all the infighting with Congress and other things that would bore even the most patriotic soul. But what I will say, sir, is that my husband has hope. And I know that General Washington will be the last person on the field of this American cause, if that is what it is called for. The, uh, the fighting men in the field, uh, the troops and infantry look up to their commanding officers, and officers uh, look up to the one man in charge, and that's your husband. And when that man, um, when he needs to be recharged, I'm sure that he's happy that you are at his side uh, at that dinner table. Thank you. Uh, the last question about this uh, subject is uh, uh, about someone else quite close to you, your son, Jack. Uh, is, he, is he serving uh, currently? My son, uh, John Park Custis, is serving in the uh, cap uh, capacity that he is expected to. He is a Custis, you must understand. He is not a Washington. And being a Custis, it has long been his expectation to serve the people of Virginia in a legislative arena. And uh, I do have the honor to, um, well, inform, since you are unaware, that he is representing just that in the House of Delegates. I cannot say that he is enjoying his time in the House of Delegates, but he is um, doing his duty to the country in that way. Uh, no, he does not serve in a military capacity, but in a legislative one. Well, uh, all roles are important. Uh, this, uh, this thing has been described as a clock, and that every cog is necessary. That's lovely, Mr. Smith. Uh, well, Did you write that? <laughs> Someone who I, who I know quite well, uh, he wrote it. He's, he's a, a genius. You should read him. His Mr. name's Hamilton? Thomas Jefferson. Oh, Jefferson. Peter uh, Jefferson. Uh, no, Peter's son. That's all right. Uh, we'll, we'll get you there. Uh, speaking of uh, other, other folks uh, around this time, we have a question. Um, if we can move, uh, make, make a pivot. We have a question about, um, from Emma, who first of all says that you look lovely. Oh, thank you, Emma. Uh, she's also asking, um, because you brought his name up, have you met a Lafayette or a Hamilton? And if so, uh, what was that uh, conversation like? Yes, of course. Uh, the Marquis de Lafayette is an extraordinarily close friend of our family. I will admit, the general was not sure quite what to do with the young Marquis when he first arrived, um, full of passion on his front doorstep. But the Marquis has proven himself to be one of the most loyal and valuable servants to this American cause. Um, the Marquis and my husband could not be more different as far as who they uh, project to the public, but they both share the same amount of zeal and passion for this American cause, and I find that they have found a, um, a sense of brotherhood betwixt the two. Mr. Hamilton, yes, he is a member of my husband's military family as well, and he uh, and I have shared, um, well, a living space in some of the headquarters. And I will say that Mr. Hamilton, um, he is a very ambitious young man. He has exceeding talent uh, with his pen, as well as with the ladies. And with that, we shall leave it. Uh, Mr. Smith. <clears throat> well, the pen is mightier than the sword, they say. Yeah, you said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we have several questions, uh, and they, they really run the gamut of uh, from your personal life to your family life. Um, we have a question about uh, childbirth. If is that too uh, too close a topic? Are you are you all right discussing childbirth? Uh, it depends upon what the question is, Mr. Smith. Well, I'll speak it, and then you can choose to sidestep if you so choose, um, like the esteemed gentleman in Congress. Uh, this is from Linda. And Linda is wondering um, uh, how, how childbirth is handled. Is midwifery uh, a thing? Is it around? And who, who might be at the bed? Oh, uh, yes, Linda, this? an excellent question. Um, childbirth 
and indeed child rearing is still dominated by the fairer female sex, of course. Uh, midwives are called for births. In fact, if a doctor is called, that typically means that the life of the mother or the child is in peril. Um, thus, it is completely a female society that attends that expectant mother during that great moment um, of birth. Um, so yes, if you are able to find a midwife, I uh, hope that you are able to find one that you trust very diligently. I was attended by the same midwife for all four of my children's arrivals. In fact, there was one midwife in Williamsburg, I seem to remember when I was younger, a woman by the name of Catherine Blakely, and she is purported to have birthed over 1,000 children during her exceedingly long life in the capital city. But um, I believe, if anything, it was in order to advertise her skill in that profession, for it is a profession indeed. Uh, that's, that's quite a mark to leave on the world, to, to bring uh, yes, in 1,000 children. I, th I think the capital uh, of... Uh, Virginia. She herself brought the entirety of the population of Williamsburg uh, into life. Nearly, nearly, <laughs> she did. Um, I wonder, uh, so we have a, a question from Angie uh, about a, another, another being in the household, and uh, that's pets. Uh, Angie has heard that your husband is a dog lover. Uh, is this true? And uh, do you mind describing, a, a, does, is there a type of dog that your husband enjoys, or how many dogs do you have there? at uh, Vernon, or how do you feel about <laughs> the canine? Angie, uh, you have struck upon one of my husband's great loves, and that is the canines. He has a fascination with them. In fact, there is rarely a time where we are walking down the street together. If he sees a dog, he will go over and greet it, sometimes before he greets the master handling it. Um, we do have quite a brood of dogs upon the estate. We have at least 35 foxhounds. My husband is an avid fox hunter when he is at home. And in fact, he takes all of the hounds with him quite frequently whenever he rides about the uh, circumference of the estate, which admittedly, Angie, is one of the quietest times in the mansion house is when he's taken all those hounds with him. But he is very attached to them. But it is not just the foxhounds that he enjoys. He enjoys dogs of all different types of breeds and uses. I think you will find that we have a veritable menagerie on, on our estate, mostly of the canine companion. And companions they all are, for my husband is uh, very kind to all of them. We have several questions left, uh, Mrs. Washington. And uh, I'm going to try to get to as many of them as possible. But of course, if there's a if there's a longer, a longer answer, then, then by all means, feel free. That being said, uh, Erin uh, would like to know, uh, she's wondering how you met your husband. Which husband? Well, I suppose the current husband. The current, the general. Yes. Well, you know, Erin, uh, Mr. Washington and I have known of one another for a very long time. Being a Dandridge and being a Washington by birth, as we both have been, um, we are of similar social circles, but our lives diverged from each other's society uh, when we were both about 18 years old, for I was married to my first husband, Mr. Custis, and of course, Mr. Washington became Colonel Washington, fighting in that late war against the French and Indians. Um, we were, I suppose you could say, reunited, as it were, in the early spring of 58, in March of 58, for I had been widowed uh, for near on a year at that point. Mr. Custis passing away in July of 57. And um, some very kind friend of ours, the Chamberlains out in New Kent, um, I suppose you could say that they decided to attempt to play Cupid with the both of us, for they concocted a meeting betwixt the two. My husband, well, he was not my husband at the time, Colonel Washington, we shall say, was in the capital city of Williamsburg attending to some private uh, matters. And the Chamberlain's estate, well, it is one estate up the river on the Pamunkey, near mine, where I was born and raised and living as the widow Custis. And Mr. Chamberlain very um, militaristically marched Colonel Washington up from Williamsburg to his estate, and it was there that we were, we like to say, reintroduced to one another, for it had been some time, but um, we at least knew of one another. And it was, um, it was a happy meeting. Um, the two of us had grown greatly, 
in those seven years. I myself had been married and had four children, and I had also lost two of my children and my husband at the time. And the colonel, well, as we've already discussed, he understood with the full weight of what a war meant to the population. And we found in one another um, characteristics of exactly what we needed in a partner to be successful in a match. In fact, we spoke so long that night that I felt for poor Colonel Washington's man, Bishop, who was out holding the horses, which I think he believed it was going to be a very short visit, but it turned into many hours. But at the end of our visit, I asked the colonel that when he were next in the area, if he would stop by my estate, the White House, in order to continue our conversation. And thinking, as his post was in Winchester, that I would not see him for several months. He was back in two weeks, a very determined man, and we continued that conversation. In fact, we continued it through that early spring and into summer to the point where we very quickly decided that we should very much like to be worthy partners to one another. He returned from the late war in December of that year, resigned his commission, and arrived at my estate on Christmas Eve, in fact, of 58. And two weeks later, we were married. We chose to marry on Twelfth Night, January 6th of 59. You know, my first wedding, I was married in May of 17 and 50, and I remember that the only thing that I truly concerned myself with was what flowers were in bloom and how high I could pile my hair on top of my head. For what part of the world could an 18-year-old truly understand at that time? But the Colonel and I decided that we should like to be married at Twelfth Night, for that is a season of hope. It is a season of renewal, and that is exactly what the two of us needed as we started our new life together. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Aaron. I apologize for waxing poetic on it, Mr. Smith. No, no apology necessary. It was, uh, it was lovely. If, if only we could all have someone at our side who waxed so poetically. <laughs> uh, we have several questions. I wonder if we can do a rapid fire. Oh, certainly. Yes, and perhaps uh, uh, 10 seconds or so with response for each one. I will attempt my and best. And that will bring us directly to the end. Uh, Gary wants to know, how, did your, how, do, uh, um, uh, your, how does Jack, I suppose, how, how does your family feel about uh, their new stepfather or this new man? Well, he's not very new anymore, <laughs> is he, Gary? Uh, being married in 59 and being at 78, if they did not like him, they should have spoken up many years ago. <clears throat> Uh, Michael wants to know uh, you being a mother, if, uh, uh, you, and you once being a subject, and now perhaps uh, uh, included in the collective body of Citizen Re, if you feel when you're at the uh, camps um, that you are somewhat of a mother to those soldiers. I believe so, in a way, for some of them need a mother, <clears throat> Mr. Hamilton. <laughs> uh, Phil wants to know, uh, I'm not going to touch that one. Phil wants to know how often you visit the general in the field. Oh, never in the field, for I would be a distraction, and I should never wish to be a distraction, Phil. I only attend the general when he calls for me in the winter encampments. Uh, Sue wants to know if Mrs. Washington rides with the hunt. <laughs> Sue, Mrs. Washington has not ridden with the hunt in many, many years uh, for reasons that we do not need to discuss just now. But uh, in my uh, younger days, I did enjoy riding out with the colonel, as he was a colonel then, but I cannot keep pace with him, admittedly, on horseback. He was always very kind to rein his horse in to keep to my pace. Uh, well, speaking of um, uh, meat, uh, Heather wants to know how is dental pain diagnosed and treated? Do you have any idea? How is dental pain diagnosed? Well, I suppose the tooth hurts. <laughs> how is it treated? Well, you find yourself a very good dentist. Dee wants to know how long is your school year? Dean wishes to know a school year. I myself am not aware as I never attended a formal school, but perhaps that's a better question to left to my son who, well, we shall perhaps not ask him as his scholastic record does not speak very kindly of schools. <clears throat> And uh, lastly, uh, the great perambulator, question mark? Why yeah. is that? Do you have any other uh, informal nicknames? Uh, none that I wish to share with you. 
Um, the great perambulator is, uh, it is a bit of a jest betwixt us because you must understand I had never intention of traveling much farther than Mount Vernon and to Williamsburg or to New Kent. And so to find myself traveling to Cambridge, to Morristown, now to Valley Forge, um, it is a different world that I ever anticipated. And so, yes, the great perambulator, perhaps I shall be known in history as. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, we only have time for one more question, so this is the, uh, the final question, Mrs. Washington, but uh, you find yourself uh, uh, continuing to impress uh, in, in, in the roles that you take on, and you do it quite well, and this new role of being uh, somewhat of a matriarch for Fanny uh, brings us to our final question, uh, and that is, uh, what are your hopes for Fanny as she grows up in, in what is a fairly tumultuous and turbulent time? You know, Mr. Smith, being the eldest of my family, it has always been my expectation to be um, next to my mother, that matriarch. I never anticipated nor desired to have the honor to raise any of my nieces or nephews, but of course the divine providence knows better than us. And I take the education of my niece very seriously for it was deprived of me to educate my own daughter. And with Fanny, as you so aptly put it, she is going to be raised in a very tumultuous time when we ourselves are redefining who we are, are we not? For we are British no longer, but we are Americans, and what does that even mean? And so Fanny already will have a very different experience that I myself even had growing up along the banks of the Pamunkey River in New Kent County. But it is my hope, as her aunt and hopeful mother figure, if she ever looks to me with that kindness, it is my hope that Fanny will be the best of myself, of her mother, and even better. For I believe that it is every parent's expectation and responsibility to ensure that that next generation is even better than the current one. And my dear Fanny, and indeed all of the children who are undergoing their formative years during this grand experiment, well, it's never happened before. And I worry for Fanny. I worry for her brothers. What new expectations will be laid upon them? But my dear hope is that I will be there to guide her during this time of redefinition as we are all attempting to understand this new normal that we are living in. And it is my hope that Fanny will take whatever poor education that I may be able to give her and that she expands upon it and only gives to the next generation. So perhaps it is, well, perhaps it is a, a grieving aunt's desire to have such an um, impression on a young girl's life. But I have every belief that Fanny will be the best of us. For her mother was the greatest favorite I ever had in the world. Friends, I told you that I had started this day with a bit of melancholy and the conversation with you has lifted my spirits and for that I must thank you immensely. Um, it has been some time since we have shared this space and I am very pleased to have had the opportunity to do so. Please know that should you ever come to Mount Vernon that you will be treated with the same hospitality that you have always shown me wherever my travels have taken me as the great perambulator. But it is my hope, friend, that the next time that we are able to share space and converse in such pleasant ways, that this conflict will be over, that the general will be home, and that we will all be private citizens once again. Good day, my friends. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our conversation with Mrs. Martha Washington, or as we might call her, a hearty, gracious, and great perambulator. This program and all of our programs here at Colonial Williamsburg are made possible through the generosity of donors and viewers like you.